Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Sunset Safari here from the western fringes of the Great Kruger National Park in South Africa, and also, hopefully, a little bit later, the Masai Mara in Kenya. My name is James Henry, and a very special warm welcome to the six or seven kids watching on Nat Geo Kids and all the rest of the kids that might be watching all over the world. Uh, you can send us your questions to natgeokids at wildearth.tv. It would be lovely to hear from you. We'd love to have any questions or comments that you'd like to send us, and you do that by asking your parents to send us questions to that email address, and we will answer you any questions you might have. Now, I'm going to stop here and tell you what our plan is for the day. Our plan is to go and see if we can find the Unkohuma pride. They're a pride of lions who were seen around about this area sometime early this morning. Now, it was quite a cool day, which means the lions could have moved. They might be next to a water hole somewhere, perhaps, or lying in the shade, and we will do our very best to find them. But what I've also just seen over here is very interesting because normally we do not see lions and leopards together because they are mortal enemies. But what we do have are some leopard tracks. Here they are, over here. Mm, sorry, let me just get into a decent position and I can show them to you because David, who is on camera today, will not be able to show you the ones that I wanted to, to show you. That is not a fault of David's, of course. He has many, many faults, but that's not one of them. Here we go. This should work. Now, you've always got to look around before you get out of the car, unlike I did there, because if there is a leopard lying in the shade just nearby, he might take exception to you getting out of the car and tripping over him. Now, what we have here is a very clear leopard track. Can you see that, David? Now, that is a male leopard track. Looks like a young male leopard. But I'm pretty sure it's just a male leopard. I mean, I don't know of any young males who should be around. And he's gone off that way. And you can see here, his tracks go. And he's walked off towards this shade over here. And with any luck, I'll trip over him in about 10 seconds. It's going to walk very carefully. Here they are. Just being careful, of course. And we have a track there. And it's going up this way. Now this is very interesting. It's carried on up there. I suspect that this is the track of a male leopard in this area called Hukumuri. Now, Hukumuri sounds like a very grand name, but of course it means chicken medicine. Why on earth you would call a leopard chicken medicine is very difficult to answer, but it was not us who named this leopard chicken medicine, uh, because of course a leopard would not be medicine to chicken, but rather imminent death. And so Hukumuri, I think, has walked up here. He is one of the territorial males and basically his north-south boundary runs in that direction there and so everything to the western side of that line is Hukumuri's territory and everything to the eastern side or left of where I'm pointing now is the territory of Tingana who's another male leopard. Anyway, that's very interesting stuff. Uh, we'll probably do a little loop around here, see if we can find Hukumuri and then perhaps we'll be very lucky and find those lions on the way back. Okay, good. Shall we continue? Yes, let us continue. A lot of you wishing that this was Hosanna. Uh, look, it's not impossible. Hosanna, for those of you who don't know, young male leopard just over three years old who was born here and recently departed for the salubrious environs of Londolozi Private Game Reserve, which is down on the Sand River, not too far from here. But I don't think this is Hosanna. It might be. I don't think it's him, though. So we'll drive up here. We might be very lucky. Of course, in the heat of the day, it's about 31 degrees or so at the moment, which is, what is that? It's about 85 degrees Fahrenheit, I think. It's quite warm for a cat to be walking around. And so you'd expect them to be lying down in the shade somewhere. And you can see, of course, that there is a huge amount of grass. And so that is very, 
very uh, well difficult makes it difficult to see leopards okay we're going to continue along here and see if we can find you a cat or perhaps any other interesting mammal in the heat let's go across to the Massey Mara where David is driving to a storm <laughs> Wow, Jumbo Jumbo boys and girls of Not Your Kids. How are you all doing today, this Saturday? And my name is David, and on camera with me today is James. James, how are you? And we're in a different country that is called Kenya, and in a game reserve that is called the Masimara. Much cooler here than it is in uh, Juma in the Kruger National Park because we are 21 degrees Celsius and about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And we want to show you two things from a distance. We want to show you some clouds and some smoke. So why do we show you some clouds? We're showing you some clouds because this time around it's time for the long rains in East Africa. The long rains normally start in the months of March, April, May, sometimes going all the way to June. But what happens before the rains come, the game rangers will always set some fires just to clean the old dry grass. So if you look in front of you or just on your screen, you can see that area is already burnt. So this was burnt three, four days ago. And if you look from a distance, you can see more smoke. I'm sure already James already told you that when you ask us questions or you send us comments, we are always full of joy. And I'm sure you know how to do that. Nod your kids at worldearth.tv. Now, that area now currently is the one that has fire. But as much as it's burning, as you can see, all that smoke, the game rangers are in charge. So we call it controlled burning. In East Africa, we do not have uh, natural fires that are, that, that are either caused by lightning or some other reasons. So all the fires we have here, we, ha we can call any fire wildfire. It's fires that we cause ourselves. And after we are happy and satisfied, it has burned the areas we want, we'll always put it off if it doesn't, you know, get out. Sometimes like last, the night before last, we had some big rains and naturally all the fire that was burning was killed by the rains. Now, my plan today is to look for any planes game. There's one particular area I wanted to go. I have seen a huge wall of rain coming from that direction. I thought, even if I get there, definitely I won't be able to see anything. Fluff, and I'll bring the windshield up. So we shall be just there, you know, coily inside with James. And we don't want to show you nothing but the rain. So I have changed my plans. I want to go to different. All righty. And before I make my new plans now, we'll take you back to South Africa to another girl who would like to say jumbo jumbo to all of you. Hello, lovely boys and girls. I am Trishal, and I'm so happy for you to have you on board. I know we're not exactly on the car right now, but I still have you here in Juma in South Africa, and you've met James, and you've met David, and now you've met me, and I've got Craig on camera with me. Hi, Craig. So what we're looking at are some leopard tracks. Now, James spoke to you about them earlier, and he had some close down near our camp and now I've got some up here which is in the north near a very nice watering hole so what I'm actually looking for is this guy right here now the ones that James showed you are possibly from a guy called Hukumuri and that is a male leopard and the and he's sort of on the western side of our reserve but this guy his name is Tingana and these tracks are very likely for him because he's been seen in this area and that's who I'm looking for today. But no sight of him yet. But the fact that I have these tracks here tell me that he's around. So what I'm going to do is be searching for him definitely because I know that he's somewhere. Now let me get back into, this, into the vehicle because we want to drive down to where there's some water. Now leopards don't usually need water they get all the moisture requirements they need from the 
the prey species that they eat or the animals that they eat, so they don't exactly need water. But if water is available, they will definitely go down and have a drink, especially since it's really hot today. It's 31 degrees Celsius or 88 degrees Fahrenheit, so it is quite hot. So I'd expect that since he's right near the water, maybe that's the way that he'll go. So why not let us make our way? Also looking for any other tracks as we go. Tracking is quite an important skill working out here in the bush because it means that you can find animals that would normally be hidden. Now, if you have a look around here, yeah, you see it's really, really thick. Can you see? Very, very, very thick. So tracking helps us to be able to find those animals. Now, Francis, you say that you would never be able to tell which leopard it was from looking at the track. Well, there's a whole process to it. It's not as if I could look at that track in isolation and know exactly whose track it was. We have to think about a whole lot of things. Firstly, leopards are territorial, which means they, they fight other leopards off for a space. And when they fight other leopards off for a space, then that is their space. So we know exactly whose space this area is, whereas the area James was in could have been right at the border where it's Hukumuri space also. So I know that there's only really one male leopard in this area. And also I know that he was around there. Now there's two other female leopards that are around in this area as well. But one is still, still quite little. She's about 16, 17 months. So her actual prints are much smaller. And then her mum, her prints are bigger than the little one, but smaller than Tingana. So that's how we can tell which track it is. I'm not some magician that totally knows these things off. Now we have somebody else here. Let me just turn off here. So this is our Buffalo's Hook watering hole. It's a watering hole that's in the north of the, res of the reserve. And we have two hippo here. And they are quite a famous couple. They're called Snorkel Sarah and Scuba Steve. And they're a pair of hippos. Look at them. So they'll dive down, they'll come back up for some air, and they'll do this all day long. And when night falls, they will come out and they'll start to eat all the grass around this area. Now you don't often see them out of water unless we are in, we are going into the evening and they start to come out when it's much cooler. Look at that. How lovely is that? So you can see that one hippo is quite much bigger than the other. And we, the one, see this one that you're looking at right now? It's got an ox pecker. It's a type of bird, a red billed ox pecker, just sat on his face. And he's going to try and clear any pests that are on him. Do you know on your dogs, you get sometimes ticks and fleas and other things like that, and irritates and bothers them. And bother them. This guy will come and clean out those, those pests that bother the animals. And you can see that he's doing it right there. He's caught something and he's eating it off Scuba Steve's head. Now Scuba Steve is the bigger one and Snorkel Sarah is the smaller one that's just dove. Rosalind, you'd like to know how often hippos pair for life. Well, Rosalind, the hippo's social structure, that is the way that they associate with one another, is not exactly like that. They don't really pair. What they'll do is you'll get one male, like Scuba Steve here, whose eyes are closed and he's obviously enjoying the sun. You get one male and he will collect many females that he will look after, if that makes sense. So in this little watering hole, he's collected this one female, Sarah. And if other females come along, he will try to impress them with his big size, his big teeth, and of course, the lot, lots of the water around here. And of course, some good grazing, some good grass around the edges of the pan. Because all those things are the things that the females want in order to grow strong, healthy babies. So you'll get a whole 
group with a dominant male, that is the male in charge, and you'll get a whole lot of subordinate females. Those are the ones that he takes care of. Now you'll also get males within that group, but as long as those those males make sh don't try to overthrow him or they know that he is in charge and they make sure that they respect him, he'll have no issue. But there is only ever one guy in charge. And over here, it's Scuba Steve that you see there. Anyway, it seems that James Henry is still on the lookout for some lions, some leopards, who knows? So let's go and have a look. Yes, I am on the lookout, but I have not found a leopard just yet or a lion, but I have found a grasshopper. Now, this grasshopper it was not, in fact, on the grass, but on the car. So somehow it has hitched a lift with us. And the only really interesting thing I can tell you about this grasshopper is that it's very clearly not an adult. Now, we know it's not an adult because it doesn't have wings yet. And if you look very carefully, just behind its head, you can perhaps see where the wings are forming. There we go. And so as a juvenile grasshopper, you can just see the little wing buds. I'll see if I can point them out. Let me see if I can find something pointy-ish. Because my finger's going to be a little bit fat to do it. Um, um, I don't think I have anything pointy-ish. Uh, anyway, basically, sorry, David. Just over, yeah, there. That's it. Where my nail is. You can see the little wing buds. And so this grasshopper will have wings, eventually. Let me turn him around so you can look at his lovely eyes. There we go. And they go through, I think it is... Mm, I've forgotten, actually, three or four in the stars. And that's what we call the sort of stage. Oh, this one's having a dump. Very nice. This grasshopper just made a poop. <laughs> there it is, in fact. Look at that, David. That's what a grasshopper poop looks like. Fantastic. Anyway, they go through three or four of these instars, or sort of juvenile stages. Apparently a number of you complimenting David for his camera work, and I'd ask you not to do that again, if possible. Thank you. Um, he's the sort of fellow you really don't want to give too much compliment to. Go to his head, and before you know it, he'll be behaving like a diva. So if I could all ask you all to just never do that again. Okay. That would be great. Thank you. I'm just quickly che checking to make sure that I'm not telling you a lie, which of course I don't wish to do. Lying would be very unfortunate. It wouldn't be a lie, though, it would be a mistake. I know that it is in the book that I'm paging through. Oh, come on, Hindry. Metamorphosis, blah, blah, cocoons. Must be here somewhere. Here we go. From wingless to winged, the development pattern is among the primitive winged insects, crickets, grasshoppers, yes, yes, but how many? In general, the nymphs that emerge from the eggs are not only smaller than the adults, but also differ in appearance. Well, it is a little bit different, but not very. It actually doesn't say, so it's probably fairly variable. I'm going to say four instars before it becomes an adult, so you call each of these stages of development and instar. This one seems to be having some sort of attack behind. There we go, it's all right. I wonder if it's eaten something that's made it feel a little ill. All right, oh, well, there we go. He's on the steering wheel. I'm going to return him to the grass now. He's got very powerful legs, as you can see. And be free! There we are. Uh, Tom, yes, it is in fact very good luck if a grasshopper poops on you, and if you leave the poop on the dashboard of the vehicle, you're all certain to find wild dogs killing at some stage during the course of the drive. So we are very lucky to have the lucky charm of the grasshopper poo sitting on our dashboard.
Let us continue. Now the tracks of this male leopard came up to the wards of the northern boundary, which is where we are now. But I have yet to find the leopard. Oh, Taryn, you want to know how big this park is? Well, that's a nice question because it has a complicated answer. The area that we operate on is about 1,200 hectares, which if you want to work it out in acres, you multiply by 2.5 and you get to roughly 3,000 acres. But it is unfenced. And so Juma, which is the area we're on now, is that 3,000 acre area or 1,200 hectares. That is part of the Sabi Sands, which is 60,000 hectares, which is about 150,000 acres odd. Uh, but that too is not fenced and it is part of the Greater Kruger National Park, which is 2.2 million hectares or 5 million acres. And that, in turn, is part of the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park, which is 3.5 million hectares, or about uh, eight and a half million acres. So it's about an eight and a half million acre area. Obviously, we are not allowed to go into all of that area, unfortunately, uh, but that's how big this area is. I'm going to reverse, because I didn't see the tracks of that leopard crossing this road. We just need to make sure we haven't driven past him in this very long grass. As I said to you, the grass is very long, and therefore it is not difficult to miss a spotted cat lying in it. David, tell me if you see a leopard. And then we will allow one compliment from the viewers for your camera work. Yep, there he is. He's come out here and he's walked straight up into the reserve next door to us, which is on the left hand side of your screen. And I'm afraid that means that our tracking exercise of that particular cat is now over. We cannot go in there. For there be dragons. Hexunt draconis. There aren't really dragons in there. It's just that we're not allowed to go there because that is a private property. Now we are going to go back to Trishala, who has managed to at least find you one mammal this afternoon, even though it was only a nostril, and see if she can have a little bit more success this time. <laughs> well, I am very scared that my leopard too has wandered off. Because I got out the car and I was looking for tracks again after we saw Scuba Steve and Snorkel Sarah and said hello. But I can't seem to find more for him. So unless he flew out of this area, he has to leave behind some sort of trail. And that's what I'm trying to follow right now. I will find him, boys and girls. I promise. I do. Now, there are other game drive vehicles that are out at the same time as us, and what they do is they can often help us. And then I listen to them on this radio right here, and then they can tell me if they've seen anything, and I can tell them if I've seen anything, and then we can come together and look for the leopards. So don't you worry, we will definitely find some exciting things. Now, James was speaking to you about boundaries and areas where you can go and areas where you can't go. This here on my right is Juma. That's where we are allowed to drive around. And this here on my left is another different reserve and it's called Buffles Hook. And that's where we can't go. So if Tingana had decided to walk across this road into there, it would be a sad, sad day. But we did have him this morning, so hopefully he will still be around. Cross your fingers for me, so that we do find him. Mita, you'd like to know how I protect myself against the wild animals. Well, there isn't really protection in terms of um, a fence or gate or... Uh, weapons 
We don't have protection like that, but the protection that we have comes from learning about the animals and learning about animal behavior and being able to predict these things. So when I see an animal, I know the type of behavior I'm going to expect. And I know when the behavior is not right or unexpected, unexpected behavior. And that's when I will know how to react correctly. Lots of people think that you'll just walk across a lion or something like that and they'll just run out and attack you. It doesn't quite work like that. What will first happen is they will first be curious about you You'll be on two legs, which is strange for them. They don't often see that because we're human. We're standing upright. And historically, back when humans and animals coexisted in the wild together, animals were hunted by man very much. So innately, which means inside of them, the way that you know how to drink water or your mother's milk, it's just natural they naturally feel a bit of fear when they see us because inside it almost feels as if they're going to be hunted in a way because that's how in the same way that you feel that if you come across a lion you're going to get bitten it's the same sort of thing and it goes both ways so we look we rely on that a lot we rely on the fact that they're not going to approach us and if they do there's certain things we'll look for. Maybe they'll, they'll stalk very slowly. Maybe they'll hiss at us like a lion does. That's hardly a hiss, but it does that sort of, as if it got scared a little bit. So there's those things that we look out for and that's how we make sure that we're protected all the time. Also, we make sure that we don't behave in any silly ways. We don't walk out too far away from the vehicle when we know that there's that there's animals around. Like I had to get out to look for more tracks of Tingana, but I make sure that I'm always looking around to see if I can see any little rosettes in the grass and if he's watching me. But the likelihood is that he probably saw me or he sees me whenever I'm out of the car around the area where he's been seen, but he doesn't want to attack me. It's not as if they are, evil creatures that want to just constantly attack us, not at all. In fact, they're far from that. So now I'm looking for more tracks. This is another boundary of, other, of ours. And I look at boundaries because that'll let me know that the animal is still inside the, the game reserve. Well, I will keep on looking and hopefully in the process come across some other, some other nice animals, especially some elephants. I'd like that. So let's go over to James Henry. I too am trying to find some other nice animals and the other nice animal that I've found for you is this butterfly. David, I'd love to give you butterflies to film because our viewers said that you are such a good cameraman and so therefore you can catch all the butterflies as they fly. Come on then. Well, they're just behind you. Oh. There's some sitting on this, well, theria bush here, which might be a little easier. They're not, in fact, moving. Can you see that one there? I think it's your head. No, dear. Is it? There we are. You can see them there. They are some of the blues. Can you see it there, David? Middle of frame. If you And up a bit. And if you could pull the focus back slightly. Now you're on the right focus line now. Now go down, tilt down. All right. Tilt down, keep tilting. Yes, yes, and right a bit. And down a bit. There, no, stop, up. Now it's flown. There we are. There it is. That's him. He is one of the blues. No, yes, in fact, I, I'm pretty sure he's one of the blues. He's beautiful. <laughs> Kirsten in the final control just saying, awesome, David, well done. Well, <laughs> she, of course, doesn't have to deal with him. Uh, let me just see if I can find this butterfly. James Richard, I'm assuming you're watching. Uh, if you would like to help me out with this, I won't say uh, th no thank you. <laughs> I'm just quickly checking my app. A lot of them look very similar. Is he gone? Yep. Okay, hang on. Let 
Let me quickly check. Blue. Now. Is he gone? I'm just quickly going through some of the zebra blues. No, it's definitely not him. I've seen that butterfly before. Ah, I'm going to go with dotted blue on that one. That a dotted, that's him. Well spotted. Right, let me go to the dotted blue now. Looks pretty good, actually. Yes. Yes, quickly, David, take the camera off it before I change my mind and show the viewers that I think I have found it. Oh, there we are. I think that's him. Now, the reason he's called a blue, of course, if David goes up a little bit, is that the top of his wings are blue. Can you see him nicely or not really? I mean, it's all right. Is it okay? A bit bright. The screen's not great. Sorry about that. But better than nothing, you know? <laughs> So a dotted blue, I think, we'll go for. There are a number of them that look very similar, but not quite as obvious as that one. Dotted blue. Anyone like to corroborate me? If you disagree with me, keep it to yourself. Beautiful. On the plant that keeps on giving, that is Waltheria indica. Now, we are coming into the area where we hope to find the lions earlier on. I got a couple of strangely differing locations from my colleagues. Steve Cantrell, would it lay an egg? Was it laying, was it laying eggs? No, I think it was feeding, Steve. I don't think that that's their larval host plant. So they eat those ones. The adults eat them but I don't think that they lay their eggs on that particular plant and so let me if I go back to it what I'll be able to do kids never use your phone while you're driving this is do as I say and not as I do if I go to the blues and find the larval larval plant dotted blue text wingspan identification distribution habitat flight period Larval food is Zizifus. So you will find that that particular butterfly will be feeding on the nectar available on the Waltheria plant and then it will fly off to a buffalo thorn like a Zizi, well, the only Zizifus we get here, Zizifus mucronata or the buffalo thorn, and it will lay its eggs on that plant so that when the caterpillars are born, they eat or they are born on their food. Basically, it's be like giving birth into um, a vat of milk, I suppose. That's a really stupid analogy and I apologize for it. <laughs> In fact, it's so bad. <laughs> now, let's see if the lions have gone down towards the water. Or if I'm going to have to walk through this very thick grass and see if I can find them. We'll go down to the water first, I think, and have a quick look-see. It's been relatively warm today. Hello, Hank. You're wondering about rain and when we last had some. Tristan tells me that we had about five or six millimeters during the course of last week. Not very much. You can see that although the vegetation is very long, it's starting to turn from green to yellow, which at this time of the year is not unusual. But I really don't think that we're going to have a very easy dry season. We have not had a lot of rain. And the rainy season, well, we might have rain in April, but after April you really wouldn't give it much chance of raining until, well, November. So I think the animals are going to have to, as they say in South Africa, fuss bait, which means to bite hard basically and it's a nice expression that means you know tough it out but for now it's just gorgeous april march best time of year out here i think 
we just pop down to this water hole. I don't see any tracks here, so I'm not sure that they're going to be here. But while we do that, let us go back to Trishala, who is, uh, well, she's driving. Yes, back to me. And I'm desperately looking for my leopard. I've gone back just a little bit because it's always important if you lose tracks or you lose um, kind of orientation on where you think the animal might be to go back to first track or last track actually. Now, I thought I saw something. I thought I saw a track. Oh, it sounds like the other vehicles are out so they'll be able to help us. No, nothing. Nothing yet. But thankfully, now that the other vehicles are out, they can also help us. Hmm. Here you can get a nice kind of view through that gap of the vastness of where we are. Look at that. Trees and trees and trees and trees. Isn't it beautiful? All those dead trees in amongst them too. And those dead trees are important because they can be nesting sites for lots of birds that will drill holes in them and then go and nest in them. So you can find little birdies, little eggs sometimes. Often you'll even find them peeking their heads out, which is quite cute. So we're still on our quest. We are indeed. Now I have one place that I have in mind that I want to check. Just in case, because I know that he likes to hang around. Another little pan that's near the big one that we went to. So I'm going to check that area out. And sometimes if I'm looking for a leopard, I can also hear if other animals are making any noises because other animals don't like leopards to be around or lions to be around because they know that those are predators, animals that might hurt them and want to eat them. So what they do is they alarm call at them. And what that means is that it's in, a, in the same way as you have an alarm in your house or your car to let you know if somebody who's going to do something bad to you is going to come along. Oh, bumpy part. There we go. So they will alarm call, which means that they will make a different kind of noise to their usual noise. And then it'll alert. Ooh. It will alert all the other animals to the presence of a leopard or a lion. Now, Bob, you'd like to know what the strangest alarm call I've I've heard is, or what, which one I think is the strangest one. And I'd have to say that a an antelope, like a, I've heard a kudu and a nyala and an impala, all alarm call before, and they honestly do sound like a dog barking. Really, really like a dog barking. Just like that. And I never think that that, that noise or that sound comes out of an of a, an antelope. Never think so. But as soon as you hear that, you know immediately there's something around you and something very, very close. Now, birds will also alarm, alarm call. And, but they can be slightly unreliable because remember, birds have a nice perch right at the top so they can see. They can see for a long way. So they might alarm at something that's far away that I might not be able to get to. Squirrels also alarm and they alarm like they're laughing. They go, like they're kind of laughing. That also is quite funny to hear, but they also have great eyesight. So they can be alarming at something that's very far away. So your best bet is always the antelope. And sometimes when the birds... <laughs> Thank you, boys and girls. 10 out of 10 squirrel, squirrel alarm call. It might have just been from, from Kirsten. Thank you, Kirsten. Now, 
Now we've just passed by that little the little dam that we had before. Now I am going to go around this area and check if Tingana is around here. Here you see lots of dead trees up around here. Ah, success! It seems that James has finally found something. See, the tracking put to good use. So, let's go over to him. Hello, and yes, we have. We have found the famous Unkuhuma pride. A pride of lions that is very, very special to us because, well, basically it's the main pride of lions that we've seen here. And it's very nice to have them. Now, at the moment, the Unkuhuma pride, if I'm not much mistaken, consists of 11 or 12 individuals, five females, and six youngsters. I'm just trying to remember to myself if one of the male lions here, he's a young male lion called a Mangani male. I'm just trying to remember if he's one of those six or if he's an extra. I think he's an extra. So if they are all present, we should have about 12 lions here. Let's see if we can count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I can count about ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Count about ten. Now, we do think that one of the adult females, obviously one of the adult females, has got cubs, and that those cubs are stashed away on that reserve where the leopard went, so just to the north of us. And we haven't met them yet, but we are pretty sure that one of them has got cubs. This is what lions do best, I'm afraid. They don't get up and do the can-can or perform Tchaikovsky's Sleeping Beauty during the day. They just do quite a lot of sleeping. Giraffe girl, you say you think they're 11 and that floppy ear is missing. I was under the impression that floppy ear had been missing for quite some time. What do you mean by floppy ears missing, giraffe girl? I actually didn't think floppy ear had made it to this stage of adulthood, but I'm, you know, it's been so long since I spent a great deal of time with this lot. Now I'm getting very amusing comments from the final control in Johannesburg. And uh, I must say, it's very interesting how cheeky the ladies of the final control have become since uh, they have left the bush. I got my camera out in order to take illegal photographs, but unfortunately, well, there's nothing really to point my great big uh, sort of professional looking device at. I suppose I could take an artistic picture of a foot. Yes. So, Giraffe Girl, you're just commenting saying floppy ear has been gone since last, last year. Now I understand exactly what you're saying. So it should be 11, actually, because, of course, floppy ear went missing. She was the sixth cub, and or sixth sub-adult. So, yes, we should have five adult females, and we should have five sub-adults. Um, and no, we should have six sub-adults with, that's right, six sub-adults with the Mungian male. I think we have still only got 10 here as much as far as I can tell, but possibly 11. And I suspect that the mother of the new cubs, who I think if is Amber Eyes, is most likely north of us tending to her young charges. 
Does everybody agree with what I've just said there? If you don't, you're more than welcome to tell me. You could easily be right and I could easily be wrong, difficult as that is for me to admit. Very peaceful. Let's be quiet and let's just have a little listen to what's going on. As you might be able to hear, very little is going on actually. But for some starlings flying overhead, going kutuk, kutuk, kutuk. That's very peaceful here. I don't know that we'll spend a huge amount of time here. We'll probably move on at some stage and then come back as it cools down. Ah. Oh, apparently. I am wrong. The youngest lioness is the mother, not Amber Eyes. I do apologize. It is on account of my absence that I am being so useless. I apologize for that. So the youngest lioness, not in fact Amber Eyes, is the new mother. I was just hoping, I suppose, on Amber Eyes' behalf. But I can't tell who's who here, other than to say that there is one male lion here. I did see him round the other side. But the rest of them are so fast asleep. Sinag, you say you love to observe lions sleeping. Well, it is very good that we are able to provide you with this level of joy as you watch these lions sleeping. Because sleeping they most certainly are. Ooh, I thought I had my silent shutter on there. Oops, the daisies. That was me taking an illegal photograph, everybody. I do apologize. That's very naughty. Joshua, it really kind of depends where you are as to how many hunts or how frequently you witness lions hunting. In this particular area, because of the terrain, as soon as these chaps get up and start hunting at, well, let's say around about sunset, it's very unusual for you to be able to follow them through for a hunt because, of course, the bush is very thick. But sometimes we get lucky. Up in the Masai Mara, where unfortunately David is stuck in a big storm, it's much more likely that you can follow lions on a hunt. And if you sit with a lion, if you sit a li with a lion for, I don't know, lion pride, say for 24 hours at a time, uh, you will see them hunting very frequently and you can watch them hunting because the terrain is such that it's easy to do. I can see one of them is sort of awake. He's open, no, no, eyes are closed again. They don't look like they've eaten f recently, but they look like they're very happily full. Timothy, I see that you have fallen victim, unfortunately, to the biological travesty that is the Lion King. Um, you want to know about, could one of these young male lions become king of this pride? Uh, no, the answer is almost certainly not. What normally happens, unlike in the Lion King, is that when a male lion is born to a pride like this, at the round about the age of three to four years, his father will throw him out of the area and he will actually have to go and live in another area and find another pride eh, to be the master of or king of, if you like, uh, or to protect. And often he will form a coalition with other male lions and they will dominate or protect two or three different prides in this area. But very seldom will the male lion born to a pride become the dominant male lion of that pride. And there's a very good reason for that, Timothy. 
Uh, the reason for that is to avoid what we call inbreeding. And so the more lions move around and the more the males or further away the males go from where they were born, uh, the better it is actually for the entire lion population. And so that's what happens. Very quiet, gentle breeze blowing over them. Ow! I was just bitten by a fly. Mm. Tomorrow you're wondering about how big lions can grow to be. Well, a big male lion can weigh up to 200 uh, kilograms, which is about 440 pounds. That's a pretty big male lion. I think the record was 260 kilograms, which is around about 600 pounds or so. So that's massive, but that's very unusual. So between 180 and 200 kilograms or so. And then a female can weigh between 120 and 150 kilograms, probably normally closer to 120. And that is about 250 to 260 pounds. Obviously, a lot of these kinds of numbers are estimates. And sometimes, yes, animals, actual animals are weighed. But often they're estimates. And there is variation between areas. So lions in this particular part of the world will weigh slightly different amounts to lions in the Maasai Mara, for example, where I think they're probably slightly heavier on average. Very peaceful Saturday afternoon these guys are having. They're not watching any sport. Travels with Sarah, there are a number of things that would wake these lions up right now. For example, if I was to set off a number of fireworks in this area, you'd find that the lions woke up quite quickly. Uh, the other thing that would almost certainly wake them up and result in quite an interesting reaction would be if I got out of the car. Now, we're only sitting about 10 metres from them, and so were I to decide to get out of this car and walk over towards them, they'd wake up very smartly indeed and most likely run away in terror. Uh, well, it could have the opposite result, but very unlikely. And so what you'd find is that uh, any kind of disturbance from something they perceived as a predator would wake them up, or a disturbance from something they see as prey. So if a kudu came walking through this woodland, uh, browsing and minding its own business, that would wake them up very quickly. And although they look like they're completely asleep, they're not. They are dozing. In the same way that you might doze on your sofa on a Saturday afternoon, uh, you'd kind of wake up if someone came into the room or if there was a loud noise outside. You, they don't sleep like we do during the night where, you know, for many of us, uh, you, there could be a bomb outside and we wouldn't wake up. The lions are not like that. And they're just so used to our voices as human beings in this particular area that even, you know, my voice won't wake them up all the vehicles coming in because they know what they are, they don't perceive them as a threat. But if I got out of this car, then we would see all sorts of action. But I'm not going to get out of the car. David, do you want to get out of the car? No, David also doesn't want to get out of the car. <laughs> okay, I believe we're going to go across to Trishala who is giving a very good demonstration of her driving skills. Yes, you are coming back to me, and of course we're still on the lookout for this leopard, but what I have decided to just stop and show you very quickly is a plant. Of course, first I'm looking around, make sure he's not around yet so I don't get bitten. But I have for you what is called a buffalo thorn. Now I'm going to take a little piece and bring it closer so you can actually have a look at it. Oh, they're quite nasty, which is what... Ow, see, they're quite nasty. Craig, can you zoom into the thorns from there? Cool, so first off, it's called a buffalo thorn and apparently I've had the berries very often, but you can even eat the leaves. Hmm. Very spinachy. 
Not bad tasting at all. Could throw that in a salad. There's even a little berry. Found a little berry. So I'm going to eat him. See what he tastes like. Hmm. Like sweet lettuce. I'm having a salad. Now, I want to break one off, if I can, without hurting myself, and show it to you up close. Eey. Oh. Oh, these things are so nasty. Now, we often say that these things get abused by us, because we see so many of them, and we talk about them so often, but I think that they abuse us more than we abuse them. Ow. Ow. Because if you have a look, maybe I should just stand up here so it's a bit better. If you have a look here, do you want me to put it on the dash, Craig? That'd be better. So you can have a better look. Okay, so you can see there's a straight thorn there and a hooked thorn on the other side. So no matter what, you're going to get hooked if it grabs onto you. Maybe. Now let me put it on the dashboard so you can have a better look. There you go. Yeah, so you get hooked no matter what, which is very, very painful. You have here the straight thorn, just to the top there. Oh, my hat, there we go. So there's the straight thorn right there, and there's the little hook as well. So you can't just move backwards and think that you're gonna make it out, unfortunately. You'll have to do quite a bit of wiggling to make it out properly. In fact, there was once upon a time when we were training that um, we were asked to cut down uh, one of these buffalo thorn bushes. It was horrible. I found so many embedded in my fingers from that slasher. It really was something else. And now I've got, I've got a little one here too. To try and take that out later. No, I'm not showing you guys. It's gross. <laughs> Lori, was that you? You said it sounds or something to the to the effect that it's horrible. It really is. It really, really is. It's one of those bushes. Well, when you, well when you think about it, considering that the leaves are tasty and palatable, and the berries are too. It would, want, it would want to protect itself against being browsed by all the herbivores. Anyway, James has those lovely lions for you, so let's go back to him. And the lions are doing as they were doing before. Not very much at all. You can see them just lying there. That one that you can see, um, well, I was thinking more the one that's lying sort of on its back there, David. Yes, there we are. Looks like it could not be more comfortable if it tried. Isn't that lovely? Mm. I think that's rather splendid. Although I don't think we'll stay here the whole afternoon. I think it would be time to head off fairly soon. I know our kids drive is drawing to a close. So we'll stay here for the end of that. Hello, Mrs. Lapwing. Your question is, where are you exactly? Well, Mrs. Lapwing, that could be answered in so many ways. Where am I? Uh, specifically on this reserve, I am quite near Gallego Shortcut and the junction with the Vuyatela main axis. So pretty much central north, north central of Juma Private Game Reserve. And if you are internet savvy, which most of you are of course, otherwise you wouldn't be watching this, you can actually find those road names on the Google map of Juma. And so you can see precisely where I am. One day we will have GPS trackers so that you can actually see exactly where we are all the time, which will be very exciting indeed. Right, well, it's time for us to bid a fond adieu to all the young kids who've been watching, so thank you very much for watching our Nat Geo Kids Show wherever you happen to be in the world. I hope that we've given you a taste of what it's like to be in Africa and to enjoy these iconic and unfortunately threatened African animals. And I hope that you will help champion their conservation over the coming years. Until next time, I hope you stay safe and happy. Bye-bye. <laughs>